a little bit about what this session is going to be about is it's my experience as a PM or a product manager for all the Microsoft solutions at Pure Storage on the flash array side of things. And I'm not going to be going into, hey, this is why you need to use this method, or we recommend that you know a module has this syntax and that you should use plurals or singular for your command line names. It's going to basically go mostly around the module file itself or the actual uh, script or binary module file and talk about you know, some things that we've learned in the trenches that have helped us. And I just want to uh, disclaim that you know, my point of view is from larger enterprises that have very specific needs and that might not be the experience that you have in, in the consumers of the modules that you might make. Um, and so I'm just trying to uh, share my experience and that I hope that it helps. So let me get started here. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to chat just a little bit about my history with PowerShell. Um, I've been uh, using it uh, since before it was called PowerShell. We'll go into a little bit about a module. Uh, I have one slide on, on Pure Storage just to kind of give you background on me. This is focused on um, kind of experiences that might help you. It at least helped us over the last 10 years as, as, as we've incremented our uh, PowerShell modules. Talk a little bit about backwards compatibility, um, particularly because most of our modules are trying to uh, prevent uh, or enable our customers from not having to be direct RESTful API developers. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about PowerShell versions. I just got out of a side uh, 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 group with some of the Microsoft folks and some other uh, folks that are attending here and they were talking about you know, PowerShell 7 and how it's not going to ship in the box for the foreseeable future. And I want to ask questions on uh, your opinions on that as well, uh, as far as you know, what module requirements should be. We'll talk a little bit about help, um, how, you know, what, what are release notes, right? It's like, well, this is what's new in this version, or uh, this is what's new in, in, in this product and in, in, in its release notes. But I want to talk about how we automate most of the creation of our release notes, right? And anything that can save you time as a developer doing stuff with PowerShell, I think it could, could help. You know, where do you publish the module? We'll talk a little bit about how we QA things. Um, and I'm going to probably run out of time for a demo. So this is my one uh, peer storage slide. And basically, as the Microsoft PM, I, my focus is on integrating. And so PowerShell is a big way that we integrate with the Microsoft ecosystem. The other big way is with the System Center suite. Um, and then, of course, you know, everything that we do in Windows. We also integrate with SMIS, which is enabling our storage to be an endpoint. There happens to be a PowerShell module built into Windows. It's the Windows feature that you can have a, a SMIS initiator as well. So um, this, this is my world, and these are the things that I focus on, and everything else here is going to be about module development. So to give you a little bit of history for me on PowerShell, um, uh, I started uh, in 1998 at Microsoft, and I was on the Exchange server team. And uh, you know, we had all of these neat names for code names for Exchange. And by the time it was 2006, we were getting ready for the next release. They went and made it uh, E12. So instead of some of the cool names like Platinum and Titanium and all these Osmium, it was E12. And around that time frame, you know, this is around 2006. You know, the last version of Windows was uh, Server 2003. Uh, 2008 was uh, another year out before it was going to ship. And one of the things that we were looking at for Exchange was to use this thing called MSH to create these scripts so that you could automate some of your uh, standard administration tasks. And at the time, administration for Exchange, like administration for many tools at Microsoft, this is kind of before MSC, where you, you know, add those MSC snap-ins. Um, it was a custom executable. It was a custom tool, and that tool would get installed. You'd load it, and through this app, you'd go and you'd manage everything, right? And what we had to do before we, we shipped is we had to uh, install the .NET Framework 2, which didn't ship with Windows, and then we'd install MSH setup, and that would get us this version of what was called Monad at the time. And here is the last email 
that we got um, when I was on the exchange team. And this was, we have RC0 of Monad, and it is now dropped and integrated with E12. Uh, and the next drop that we got, it was no longer called Monad, it was called PowerShell. Uh, and it was a requirement that PowerShell and the .NET framework were installed on Windows before you could install Exchange. And this was like a momentous thing. And one of the things that was, two things happened here that were unique. One was that our admin UI now was not this custom application, it was PowerShell. And the second thing was is that some people need a GUI. It's Microsoft, you need a GUI. Well, the GUI was going to be a web interface that called the PowerShell, right? And so the idea was, yeah, it's a web interface, but here if you're going to you know, add a user or delete something or create a, you know, uh, something in email, um, an alias or something, it would then call the PowerShell commandlet and properly populate the parameters. So this is actually a couple of weeks from now would be 18 years ago. And this is when uh, PowerShell, this was the first serious server application Microsoft shipped that required PowerShell. So what is a module? Um, I mean, most folks who have dealt with PowerShell modules, you know that you, know, you need a script file, right? And a script file is something that, it, from a module perspective, you want to make it a function. And what is a function but a fancy way to expose what you need to have happen as a commandlet? Right? And there are lots of tools within PowerShell that originally were core pieces of PowerShell that now even these core PowerShell commandlets are modules, right? And you know, things like PowerShell get and all these uh, other things that were, a lot of things that were built into PowerShell are now um, modules themselves. And so, you know, it's really simple to create your own manifest if, if you, if you want to do that. These aren't things that you necessarily need if you're, if you're just, you know, going to manually install stuff, but when you start pu publishing things, uh, you start to need that. The module file itself can be a script, right, text file, or it could be binary, and, and we utilize both and for different reasons, and I'll get into why. Um, you know, this is what, you know, the text looks like if you open up any, you know, script file where you have, this is my function, and that function is, in this case, is called get pure storage back of available drive. That is exposed as a commandlet, and you can get help on it, things of that nature. And then what it actually looks like, you know, when you execute it, you can see that you know some of the, the parameters are required, um, and then it's going to give you an output. So this was just a very very simple commandlet that hey, I know that this remote Windows server, it could be with server core, it could be desktop edition. I want to mount a drive to it that I've cloned from something, and I don't know what available drive letters there are. This is one way of doing it. The other way of doing it would be to, you know, connect uh, to a session to it over SMB and create a folder and then maybe mount it as a, a mount point. A binary module, um, in, in this case, it's going to most likely be uh, C-sharp, right? This is, you know, using the .NET framework. Um, and last year at the PowerShell Summit, I had two of my engineers here, and they demonstrated um, how they use automation, and they used a couple of different tools, um, and that automation would interrogate changes in the API on one of our storage endpoints and create the functions for the next version of our SDK. Um, and so uh, Danielle and Zenhow are, are two folks that I work with um, almost every day, uh, and they demonstrated that, and that is one of the reasons why um, out of all the different modules that Pure uh, publishes, that our PowerShell SDK 2 is binary. And that's because we're using these techniques um, to do code generation, right? It's not perfect, like we'll have to go in and, and check some things, but um, it's changed from about five, six years ago where we had two developers that would spend one to two weeks a quarter so that we actual dev work so that we could publish a PowerShell module, and now we have one developer that spends maybe half a day um, whenever we're getting ready to ship an update to our PowerShell SDK. So that's pretty cool to have all that automation. And I'll talk about some of the other automation beyond just the code generation in the binary module itself uh, in a few more slides. So one of the things that um, 
we found and in, in that I would recommend, unless you have a really good reason for it, is that you wanna utilize the built-in PowerShell tools. And so what I'm showing up here is I'm showing the environment of the module path so you can see where is PowerShell going to look for modules. And you can see that it's looking for, you know, under my user account, it's looking under PowerShell v1 modules and it's looking under program files, Windows PowerShell modules. And one of the things that I'm doing is I'm doing a directory uh, listing of a file and that file is called remoteexchange.ps1. That file is the exchange management shell. And so if you ever get on to an exchange server, that file is how you manage exchange and notice that it isn't in the path for PowerShell. So if you're trying to do, you know, get module or get, um, not get installed module, but if you just do get module, it will show all the modules that are in memory of that PowerShell session. And then get installed module will show only the modules that have been installed via PowerShell get, right? So if you grabbed it as uh, manually uh, grabbed it and you know copied it to the server, you wouldn't get it under get it installed module. So this makes it harder to troubleshoot if you're hiding your module. Uh, and the way that Exchange gets around this is the bottom line here, this is the command that Exchange uses to launch the Exchange management shell. So you can see they can get around it because they're launching the PowerShell and they're going through and uh, doing all of that. The other thing that um, I'm showing up top is that they put an alias on get help uh, inside of the exchange management shell to just help. So I'm doing help on a basic commandlet to see which databases are, are loaded and it's failing. It's like, well, <laughs> it doesn't exist. Heck, there isn't even a get help because it's not loading all of the modules. It's loading specifically just what exchange needs. And so that is going to make it difficult, right? Um, if you're large, you're Microsoft or you're the exchange team, you're the VMware, Power CLI team, um, you can force people to get help dash online and it opens web pages and you can search all of that and they could completely erase all of the help opportunities in your functions. Uh, but the feedback I would share with you is that my customer feedback is that they want it all within the module. Um, and if you hide it and force people to side of the module or force people to see or use specific commands to get access to things that are common to PowerShell users. And the only way that you really know about that is by you know, getting your Google foo or forcing a banner when you load your module to see that. And you, you'll see that both with Exchange and with VMware's Power CLI. They give a banner and then they show ways to get online help and then they have you know, some custom commands. And so this, is, this will be one piece of feedback. You know, you, use the get help. So what are some things? You know, don't hide your module. Um, you should be able to use the PowerShell tools to troubleshoot things, right? So if at all possible, the feedback that I've gotten, um, we used to offer our modules for download in multiple locations, not just on the PowerShell gallery. Um, at one point, there was kind of a philosophical discussion of, you know, well, the PowerShell gallery is out of the box untrusted. Should that be the only place that you get it? the customer's only gonna trust it if they can download it off of purestorage.com, or maybe they'll trust that it's, because it's signed, it's on GitHub. Um, and we used to have it in lots of different places, but again, if PowerShell Git doesn't install your module, then half of the functions that you don't think are actually commandlets from PowerShell Git won't recognize that it's there, so it won't show you that it's installed, it won't allow you to do an update module and something that isn't installed via PowerShell Git, et cetera. Um, and uh, the, the, so that, that's that. And then uh, please create help. Uh, customers really want to be able to get help on a commandlet and understand what that is. Um, PowerShell has really changed in the past. If you installed a new version of the module, right? You'd go under modules and you know, your um, special module is there. And if you updated it, it just overwrote that folder, right? Um, I don't know how many years ago they started, okay, what version is this, right? And they're creating subfolders for all your modules. And then now that you have these different ones, what, how does PowerShell normally behave? Is it's gonna grab the highest uh, version and that's what's loaded. And so if you, you know, get command module, whatever, you should see the highest version. 
if you have some experience with PowerShell, right, and everybody at this conference is, is you know, probably more experienced than me, um, being the PM and not the one who's actually writing the module, um, it is trivial for you to go in and let's say you wanted to unload this version because the wrong version's there, this or that. Um, in the case of our experience, a, we wanted to make sure that you, know, you could have multiple versions of the module installed simultaneously and that that's not gonna break anything. Another thing that we wanted to make sure, and if anybody caught uh, Anthony Nocentino's talk uh, the other day where he was showing off you know, different API mentality and how I'm able to go through and, and figure out you, know, you don't wanna break things. And so how do we not break things? You have the API world of, well, you don't want to go from a 1.0 to a 2.0 API and break all the scripts that work with the 1.0. But at the other side of things is that sometimes things change in your code that are out of your control that the behavior will be different. And so if you can behave as a certain API version, uh, and in the case of all, most of our modules, we allow you to specify which API version should it communicate with. Um, because by default, it's going to try to communicate at the highest API version that the client and the endpoint support, right? So when we release a new version of the SDK, it will support up to version X of the API. If your endpoint doesn't support that high, that negotiation when we first connect, it'll go down and then we'll connect and things will be great. If the endpoint supports a lot higher version of the API, and because of that, they've now changed something so that the default behavior won't be right. You might need to back off on the API version and being able to handle that. It really depends on what your endpoint is. For me, my endpoints are all storage devices um, that have monthly releasable builds. I can't compete with that um, ship iteration date, right? I, I'm not a CICD uh, yet. And so because of that, we need to make sure that we can be very specific on that API version. Some other things uh, that we have done is uh, if you are way behind and we have customers that um, do not adopt our integrations as fast as they update the um, uh, versions of the firmware on the storage devices. And so because of that, there's lots of new functionality on the storage devices. Uh, a couple of years ago, we added the ability to do uh, this thing called Active DR, where it would automatically replicate, but there was no knowledge of that in any of our commandlets. And so what we did is we added SSH so that we could, as a commandlet, um, so that we could have a CLI available to you so that e the APIs aren't up to spec because, hey, it doesn't know anything about Active DR in this version of the PowerShell Toolkit or the PowerShell SDK, you can still get your work done by using uh, the CLI, by exposing the CLI. Um, one of the other things that we've done is we have some commandlets where um, if you think of a, an SDK that's trying to expose APIs on a storage array, that's one thing. We also have use cases where we're dealing with um, LUNs inside of Windows, for instance. And we wanna be able to allow you to run the operation from any PowerShell session because you're gonna declare the endpoint. You're gonna declare, hey, this needs to occur on server two. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up a remote PowerShell session. Uh, and one of the ways that we're able to do that um, is just built in you know, remote PowerShell, that, that, that's trivial. Um, but the harder part, um, I mean, it's not trivial if you have security really locked down because you can have things like Windows Remote Management blocking it and having to specify hosts that are allowed to connect and things of that nature. Uh, but one of the things that we really wanted to do in a lot of our PowerShell modules is allow them to work on PowerShell Core, meaning PowerShell 7, meaning also not just on Windows, uh, so cross-platform. And so most of the customers that I work with um, use the OpenSSH feature in Windows so that they could be on their Mac or their Linux device and initiate that and they can open and create that session. So that's one of the things that we did. Um, yeah, and then this is just a link for if you never installed it, it's literally uh, one PowerShell command to install the feature and then you're ready to go. And then it's really easy 
um, it's not just us. It's just imagine that you have a PowerShell session inside of uh, Linux and you want to connect uh, to a PowerShell session on Windows. So almost in the box. Here's an example of help. Um, so this is just an example right before the function call of uh, a help for a particular commandlet. And this is, these are the things that you can query. Um, and there's different parameters on get help, right, where it will full give it to you everything. Maybe you just want um, the examples that are called out as examples. And here is me showing just, you know, connecting to one of our arrays, um, you know, get help on that connection. And you can see um, all the different uh, uh, endpoints, uh, parameters that are needed, potentially needed to, to get in here. So please use get help. Um, dynamic help is something also that is built into PowerShell. Um, a lot of these things have to be declared in the manifest file. Um, but the reason that uh, dynamic help is interesting, and most folks have opened up a PowerShell session or done some sort of like a get help and seen, hey, do you wanna dynamically grab the new help? Uh, I mean, you can specify, hey, update help on this particular module, but most people just type update help and hit enter. And then the, your PowerShell session sitting there for 15 minutes while it grabs 500 different <laughs> module updates. Um, but the big key here is if you do do dynamic help, right, then that means that if you fix bugs in help or typo or expand examples, et cetera, that you're able to get them without waiting for the next version of your module to be released, right? Um, so there are modules where that would make a lot of sense. There are also some modules that are released on a very quick cadence, right? So if you're releasing updates to your module on a very short interval basis, then you might not need the dynamic help. You'd rather than update the module. One of the things that we'll find is, you know, this is the default in your manifest, help info URI, um, and then here is in one of our modules where we do support dynamic help. And the lesson learned would be, where is this? And who owns that? Uh, one of the problems that we had is in this case, this happened to be a bucket somewhere in AWS. And six years after we were using it, somebody in some other department looked at it and said, hey, we don't need this and deleted it. So um, make sure you know where your, your dynamic help is being stored and make sure somebody who's responsible for modules um, has some say over that, that destination and, and so that it can't get deleted out from under you. A little bit of uh, troubleshooting pain point uh, that, that we've gotten and problems that we've had. Um, this is an example command of, you know, show me all the available active and listed versions of PowerCLI in the PS gallery right now. And it goes all the way back Five, you know, 6.5 all the way to one that's, you know, a couple of days old. Um, and does this matter, right? Because you can simultaneously install multiple versions, um, no problem. Uh, I have a couple of modules that require PowerCLI because it's one thing for me to copy something in a storage array and expose it somewhere, but I need to be able to talk to vCenter to say, hey, this happened to be a virtual volume and it goes, it needs to be exposed to SQL VM3 right, instead of SQL VM1, which was the source. So I, got, I have to be able to communicate with vCenter. And it turns out that, um, you know, this should work, right? And if I do something like this, hey, you know, get rid of the module out of memory, and then just import this module, it, it should be fine. Um, and I was so confident, and I get on a call with a customer who's having a problem, and we go through all this, and it's still not working. And we're like, okay, what's going on? And we're searching for the module. And that's when I learned, you know, three years ago that get installed module doesn't show the 50 times power CLI was installed manually through the MSI. And it's in like 50 different folders on all these different users and all over the place. Um, and they literally had, I think, almost every version installed on their production server. So um, I would just say, uh, do your best to support multiple versions at the same time, but be aware that some of the dependency modules that you may have um, 
have lots of issues uh, where they're installed uh, you know, on, on 50 different user accounts with different versions all over the place. Um, and we just had a heck of a time uh, cleaning that up, but we finally did. So I'll show you why we got into this situation and one of the things that we're looking at for fixing it. So this, this top section here, all we're doing is we're saying, hey, if this parameter being is being used, uh, vCenter address, meaning you're trying to connect to a vCenter endpoint because it's a VM versus if it wasn't a VM, you wouldn't need that parameter. So it's an optional parameter. We're checking then, okay, get module list available, VMware Power CLI. So A, if they didn't use, if they didn't get it from the PowerShell gallery, it won't show, or the version that's causing the problem won't show with that. Um, the other thing that we're not doing is we're not importing the module. And so one of the things that you can do when you import a module is you can say, hey, just into this session, get at least this is the minimum version, right? And so that's an option that we could use. Another one is we can do some sorts and look around and say, hey, is there, um, any module that's in memory that's at least this build, right? Um, so these are some things that, that, that we've found and, and we're working on some uh, uh, ways to prevent uh, many, many errors because the sub-module that we require that is not from our company um, is causing issues. Here is um, an example, and you can't really see it, but in the middle of the screen, what I'm doing is I click this view PowerShell script. And so this is taking some learnings from the exchange time frame where we did something as a GUI, and we want the GUI to call the PowerShell, right? And so there's a little bit of GUI, hey, the buttons and is, are the things doing the right thing? But the GUI's not making a C-sharp call or a direct API call or doing something else, it's doing the exact same code. So our support matrix of testing and QA shrink, shrinks dramatically by ensuring that the operation that does a change, um, whether it's GUI or whether you're manually doing it in the PowerShell session is using the same commandlets. And so this is, this is, this is one of the things that we've found um, has really helped us. Another thing um, is PowerShell versions. And so if you go back, I don't know, maybe 2018, 2019, around the PowerShell 6 time when they were splitting off the .NET Core, um, it either worked in you know, the, the, the .NET Core version of PowerShell or it worked on the framework version of PowerShell. Since 7 something, they put in so much so that your .NET framework script or binary will mostly, they, they say high 90%, will mostly work on, on PowerShell core. So the question is, you know, when should we upgrade, right? It's a different version of .NET Framework. Um, our SDK is still using like .NET Framework 3.5, uh, I think some 4.8, uh, and our developers wanted to upgrade, right? Hey, let .NET Framework's now five, six, you know, I don't, I don't even know if seven's out yet. Um, so one of the things that we found is that .NET Framework uh, or PowerShell 5.1 is still the default and only version in the next version of Windows. Um, and you know, I, I just got a chat with the Microsoft PowerShell folks for half an hour right before this, and they have a different long-term support agreement with what's going on in the open source world versus what's going on in Windows. Anything that ships in Windows has to last the entire um, primary support and the entire extended support, which all together is a decade, right? Whereas all the .NET core and the PowerShell 7 stuff is like a three year and, a th and then a three year extended support. So there isn't a near term where it's gonna ship in the box. Okay, why do you care, why do you care? Because I'm a PowerShell user, I'm needing to use a module to get my job done. PowerShell 5 ships in the box, why would I ever consider PowerShell 7? Besides all the new things that are going into PowerShell 7, one of the things that you're going to find is that 
in the manifest, you can specify a lot of minimum requirements, right? You can specify the host version, you can specify the version of PowerShell, all these different things. And we're starting to see more and more uh, modules published in the PS gallery that are requiring PowerShell 7. My problem is that not everybody who uses my module is using it on their laptop. And because of that, um, it's on server. And a lot of the customers that I have either are forbidden, you cannot grab some random binary and install it, it has to be on the approved list, uh, or you just cannot install any binary, right? They have these custom configuration manager images. This is my you know, SQL basic, this is my server core, this is my this app, um, and that's all you can deploy. Um, and then the other problem is that I have a lot of customers that are on this like something Sigma, like Six, six, six Sigma, where they will not introduce any change into production uh, except for twice a year. There's like this six month freeze window. And so even if they wanted to do it, they would be blocked for a long period of time. So um, I mentioned how the .NET framework now is mostly compatible and that's good. Um, we engineer and we test for that because we want both our SDK and some of our other modules to ensure that they will work cross-platform. And then, you know, when do we force PowerShell 7? Um, one of our partners, Cisco, has one of their many modules right now that already is forcing it. If you do a lot of stuff in Azure, you'll notice that some of the Azure modules require it. Um, down here, I've put a couple of links if you want to dig in a little bit more on you know, some of the stuff that Microsoft's published on breaking changes that have, uh, when you're migrating from the framework and also um, a little bit on the .NET standard. So right now, my recommendation to my engineering is that we shouldn't force it um, and that as long as Microsoft supports it until they ship it in the box because we just don't, we have, it's not a majority, but we have too many customers that need to run the module on the server. What if? Um, so what if is a neat little tool to go, I mean, it, it, I use it every single time I try to publish a module. I wanna make sure everything's looking good. It doesn't catch everything. Like if the, uh, the token or the key isn't, you didn't pick the right one and it's set for a different you know, uh, module repo, um, but, it, but it checks a lot of things. Um, one of the things that we found is that um, what what if does is it will, um, if you pass what if as a parameter, then the should process should be false. But you can have what if and confirm. So if you do what if, which makes it false, and then confirm, but you say no for confirm, it should be false. But then we had a custom confirmation for a very specific uh, small number of commandlets and that was because the operation was destructive. And we found that in this triple whammy of strange configuration that we would execute even if you used a what if. So be very careful um, if you do go beyond the standard con confirmation and you have your own pop-up, your own, are you sure you wanna do this? Uh, because because you, we wanna pass a specific error mess or warning message and everything. Um, we learned that, uh, yeah, we, we, we had a bug. So here's where you could get a real deep dive on you know, what's going on with should process because it kind of goes through all these parameters and it's something that we had screwed up. Release notes, um, can we automate that? So um, I have a lot of modules that my release notes are, hey, what's new? I'm kind of up on what's going on because we have a bug system where we're tracking things. For us, we use Jira, and so I know, you know, these are the epics, these are the new features, this is what's going on. Um, since I'm aware of that, I could sit down and write two paragraphs in three minutes, and that's the release notes. So not too big of a heavy lift. But one of the things that's the heavy lift is our PowerShell SDK. So I already mentioned, and if you saw the session last year, how we use Jinja and, and Swagger and some other things to do the, the, the code automation. Um, we also have written some PowerShell scripts that go through old version, new version, and we check, hey, what functions or which commandlets have new parameters, which commandlets have a parameter that's been removed, 
functions or, or commandlets do we have and which what's been deprecated, right? And so boom, takes one second. Every time we get ready to release a new update to our SDK, the release notes ship as part of it because we run it as part of our build process and the release notes are part of the package and no one now does release notes. Here's an example. At the top, it's too small to read, but it says commandlet changes. On this release, we added the following X commandlets that happen to be 22. And then it's like, these commandlets have new parameters. Here it's saying, hey, admin name is a new parameter. And then if I had you know, another four pages, you'd see that there are parameters, uh, commandlets that had two new parameters or parameter, commandlets that had par uh, parameters removed. So if you're doing something that that those types of changes occur. Um, probably in the time it takes you to write the release notes once or twice, you could automate creating your release notes, at least what's changed section of it, right? And so that, that would be something that, that could potentially save you time. For publishing, um, we publish all over the place. We used to publish, like I mentioned before, on our website, in GitHub, on the PS Gallery. Um, and so one of the things that we do now is we still have GitHub, but we don't publish to GitHub. So we no longer do releases for some of our modules because we want everything to be installed as much as possible through the install dash module. And then the folks that are on a dark site, you can still download the new package on the PowerShell gallery. Yet we still have GitHub. And mostly that is so that uh, we can reach the savvy, PowerShell-aware customers that can give us feedback right away. This is broken. We're having an issue with this. Um, rather than it getting going through the standard RFE or request for enhancement where they've got to talk to their support rep, which they have to open a ticket, and it's this long, convoluted process. Instead, they can open up something right away. And hey, PowerShell Get from Microsoft even has a GitHub uh, without releases as well, right? And that's for the exact same thing. It's so that you can uh, file issues, et cetera. Um, one of the things that we started doing uh, about a year and a half ago is pre-release. And so what pre-release allows you to do is add a dash and some characters to the build number. Um, there's some caveats. The biggest caveat is that um, it doesn't work with uh, PowerShell get that ships in the server, right? And so not only do you have to update the new get, you have to update PowerShell get. Uh, an alternative would be to simply install PowerShell 7 because it's all there and updated, et cetera, right? Versus the version of PowerShell 5.1 that ships in the operating system doesn't have those. So if you have a version that uh, is updated, the, the 5.1, or you have PowerShell 7, at the top, what I did is I did a find module and I named one of my modules. And then I said all the versions, I repo of PS Gallery, and I did an allow pre-release. And we didn't get any pre-releases. But if there had been a viewable pre-release, it, it would have been visible there, and only then. If you use the dash allow pre-release with PowerShell 5.1 and you haven't updated NuGet and PowerShell get, it won't show anything. It might actually err. I think it errors because it doesn't understand that parameter. In the middle there, you can see that I've got three versions and that there's a, a dash alpha. And that dash alpha was some stuff that we had a couple of customers that wanted access to some new functionality right away. And we, our cadence was gonna be two months later before we were released. So I was able to quickly release it as a pre-release. On the right, you can see where it says module version uh, and it says pre-release dash alpha. That's, what, uh, that's how you specify you know, what type of pre-release it is. At the very bottom, this semver is how they are stack ranking the, the, the releases. When it's a, a, a binary number, of course, you know, which number's greater would be the, the most recent one. But when it comes to this, dash alpha is a smaller, a smaller version than dash beta, for instance, or dash A is smaller than dash B, right? And so you can, you don't have to use alpha, beta, any of that, but just know that it alpha, alphabetically, um, the higher alphabetically it is, the lower the build number it is, technically, right? Um, 
So this is something that we've uh, been able to, to use a lot with some of our customers uh, for a couple of our different modules. And this is something that we're gonna do going forward because our release cadence on our SDK uh, is not gonna be a monthly releasable build, yet the release cadence on our operating system and our storage arrays is a monthly releasable build. Uh, and particularly, uh, it's starting to get uh, even tighter than that because we're doing a lot of stuff in Azure. Uh, and a couple of months ago, we just released uh, being a storage option for AVS, which is Azure VMware Services, and the what they call the run commands or the run libraries, which are basically a fancy name of the Microsoft hosted internal uh, PowerShell modules that their partners release, that you're not like installing them, but they're called from within Azure, um, is really, really tight. So being able to uh, update our stuff quickly so that the folks in Azure can get access right away uh, is important. At the bottom here is everything you need on pre-release versioning. A little bit on Q and A. Um, the book that they're handing out, uh, man, I wish I had that 20 years ago. Um, it, it took me like five years wondering where's the mo PowerShell module SDK so I can learn how to do this and compile it and do all. It. And it's like you don't even have to do that, um, and it's really easy. And you've been able to use Pester installing it to run some automation. Um, we use Pester. Uh, we use Jenkins as kind of our orchestration engine for all of our testing, but it's because we do more than just tester, uh, Pester. Um, we need to make changes on our storage endpoints, and because of that, we use a lot of C Sharp to inject those changes on the configuration so that then when our um, PowerShell modules go through because we need to be able to, you know, show me this and be something there, or we need to show that there's a change, um, it, or we need to update something because the endpoint has changed, right? So, hey, you had a fiber channel card die, so you put a new one in, so the server has a new WWN. We need to be able to go in with our PowerShell module and update that the WWN's changed on the host record. All that has to go in this order. Then we need to give feedback that it that it worked, right? Um, so I would say that some of the, the lessons learned on this are um, we spent a lot of time publishing test results in Jenkins, and we didn't have anybody that really looked at it. So we found a bug that only occurred in a rare configuration case, um, and it turned out that our reporting had shown that it had failed since we made the breaking uh, change uh, about six months ago, and nobody was monitoring it. So we, we changed how we monitor it, and now whenever we have uh, in, in our Jenkins thing, it would show up as red or a failed test. We get an email report, and we get a Slack message, and all this kind of stuff. But um, just because you did the right thing, and you're reporting that you're you know, testing your, your builds and your, and your changes, you've got to actually take action and actually know that, <laughs> that something's failed. Um, another problem we've found is that the defaults do not always work. And so a lot of times in a PowerShell module in your function, you've got to give some default, right? You've got to give some timeout. How long is it going to sit there before it exits, right? Is it, will it literally sit there forever, right? That, that, that would probably not be a, a recommendation. And we found that in, in a, a, a bunch of cases that we need to change that default um, particularly because you're in a, in a it's, it's a new piece of hardware that be behaves differently, or you're in Azure and Azure behaves differently. Um, and so what we've done is we've created a configuration JSON for our main SDK, and if this file exists, we will overwrite the defaults with what you put in here, right? And so just think that through when you're creating a module, if there's, I mean, you don't want things to wait for infinity, and so you're gonna put some sort of a timeout. You're gonna put some sort of a number of retries, things of that nature. Um, if you need to change that, um, you wanna prevent the parameter creep. And this is a problem that we have in Azure. Some of our param some of the, uh, the commandlets that we have to use in Azure have like 50 different parameters on them. And we have to because of all the different, and this isn't stuff that's exposed to the end users, but it's like, we're standing up an AVS instance and connecting, standing up our CloudBlock store and connecting it all together. There's 
all these credentials and all these things that we have to, fewer parameters is better. And so that, that, that's just a, a big recommendation. It also helps with the test matrix, right? <laughs> um, so the defaults don't always work. Um, if you caught Anthony Nocentino's great demo where he was showing almost an order of magnitude faster when he was querying for things on our endpoints, right, by asking the endpoint to filter and just send what the top 10 instead of, and I've done this before, right, hey, get all volumes, 50, or get all snapshots, even worse, like 50,000 things come back. Um, and it's just going for you know five minutes. Um, whenever you can filter on your endpoint, if that's at all possible, it's going to depend on whatever your module is talking to and whether it supports it. Um, it's not just the time factor, right? It, it, if you're asking for the 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 top ten of something and it sends over you know, you know three kilobytes, that's different than it sending over fifty megs, the uh, the bandwidth and, and and the pain and everything else. Even better would be if your endpoint allowed you to narrowly search so that if you said, give me something, it didn't give you everything that was that, right? And so um, that, that's the hidden thing is that there, everything has a cost, right? And so I'm a, if I'm asking for something that has 10,000 items in it, at the end of the day, if it's only sending the 10 to me, the storage array still had to do the work of enumerating the 10,000 items to find the 10 that were the biggest of whatever you were looking for. Logging is also something that's really important, but you have to understand why are you logging and where is the benefit of that and um, how noisy is it, right? So this is something that we're constantly fighting with because we have two layers of logging. We have logging on some of our modules because we need that for troubleshooting um, because it, it could be very complicated. For instance, I have a, a module that can take a backup of a SQL database, but it uses VSS. And so you've got Windows, you have VSS, you have the storage array, you might have vCenter involved. You have, it can get very complicated. Now you're connecting to a remote SQL server, so now you have PowerShell remoting and Windows RM. The amount of things that could be configured wrong or that could be broken by FIPS and turning on security stuff and this and that, is high, and so in, in that specific area, we log a lot, um, and those logs are intended to be something that um, our support can look at, but even our savvy users can look at. Um, in this case, I'm just showing you that uh, in one of our, uh, we didn't invent it, we're using um, Log4Net, which is an open source uh, logger, and here you can see how I'm calling it, and, all I'm specifying are some things on how is it logging, right? Am I overwriting? Am I appending? How big can the file get? Things of that nature. Um, but logging is important. The other thing that we have found is that some of our customers um, that are not on dark sites, we will log very minute amount of detail on our storage endpoint to be able to say, hey, this module was used on this storage array. And this is important in an aggregate like how many of our customers use this module? How many of our customers that use this module use this on all of the endpoints or just on one endpoint, right? And we use that kind of information to help us prioritize further development on certain modules or certain features. Um, and now we're getting to the point where we're working on um, even smarter uh, logging on our endpoints where we can tell say the top five commandlets used out of the module, right? And the reason for that is like, what's being used? What's important? Where should we spend the time to make them better? And, and so logging can be really, really important. And I know I've run out of time, so let me just really quickly finish here. One, here is an open bug that we have. And the open bug is that if VMware, in this case, has a setting on the VMX, which is on the, on the VM, where the disk enable UUID is set to false, or if that tag is missing on the descriptor file for the VM, then you get the top behavior, which is when you're in Windows and you do a get desk, which is a Windows command, Windows command lit, and we're getting the information on the disk, you get this weird SCSI and this whole string, 
and that, nothing in that string can match to the serial number or the UUID in VMware or connect it back to me. The way it's supposed to work is right here, and that's the serial number for the disk, disk device. Um, and it turns out that there are, it's a 45 minute conversation of all the very strange corner cases on how you can get into this state, but the easiest one is you've had this VM has lived for 15 years, and you've upgraded it and migrated it to new versions of VSX, and even though you've updated the hardware version of the VM, it will still have this behavior unless you go into the VMX file and change it to true. And so one of the things that we're going to add as a way to de detect this and to then ask the customer to make this change on, and so a lot of the feedback we get are from escalations and we want our modules to be smarter so that the customer doesn't waste any time. Um, here I'm just saying, you know, examples are really important. And again, here's another no Centino to the rescue. We, you have this module, how do you use it? Get help showing you on one commandlet. How are you doing your use case? What are the most common use cases that the customer is gonna use your module for? Can you demonstrate that somewhere? And here is a screenshot of uh, our GitHub repo. Hey, you wanna do this thing? Here's a lot of deep info on it, and here's sample code, right? Because if you did get help, this sample code is going through like 15 commandlets to get your entire use case done. Please document that somewhere, right? It's one thing, to, I'm talking about the get help, but then, oh man, don't have your users have to spend weeks going through all the commandlets to try to figure out how to make it work. Give them some sample scripts. And so I think that's what I've got. So I wanna say thank you very much.